Oh, that's nice. Mm. That's nice. Tell me yeah, about man. Bob. Tell me about Bob. Well, you see, all right. I worked with the Whalers Band Whalers in 1973 band. when they were promoting the album Catch a Fire. Right. Right. The tour started in the UK, right, with Bonnie Peter and Bob and Family Man on yeah. bass, his brother on um, drums, and Wire Linda on keyboards. So they were known as the Whalers then. Right. Right. After the tour finished, Bonnie Whaler quit the group. This was 1973. Right. Bonnie Whaler quit the group and decided to go back to Jamaica. So when we when the tour finished in the UK and the next tour now is the US now, he wasn't there. So we had to bring in Joe Higgs, who was their tutor, who taught them harmonies and all and groomed them. So he had to come in to fill in for Bonnie. Oh. Right. So the tour the tour started in Massachusetts at a place named Paul's Mall, where he did um 12 shows in six days, two shows per day at this place. Mm -hmm. And then the next um, bandstand was in New York at a place named Max Kansas City, where the Whalers were opening for Bruce Springsteen. Right? And we did we did 14 shows in six days <laughs> and the weekend were on the weekend was three shows per day <laughs> and weekend, you know and that's when um this journalist named g fitz bartley who was well known in jamaica he was writing for a magazine in the states he took me to bob and introduced me to bob because i was touring with johnny nash long before bob came in johnny nash was called the king of reggae before bob was the king of reggae whoa and johnny Oh, and yeah, I know Johnny. I remember Johnny. He came to Johnny Jamaica. Johnny Nash, yeah, the black yes, American do... guy. Right, 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 he right, came right. to Jamaica in the 60s and they he, he did he some reggae songs. Some reggae song, Hold Me Tight, yes. Stupid. And yes. then he re recorded some of Bob Marley's songs, Guava Jelly. Yes, you know, Guava Jelly. And he did yes. a song, I Can See Clearly and Things. So he clearly. was called the king of reggae oh. long before Bob I, oh. was even known. Okay. You know, because he's a black American, he was getting earplays and black radio stations and everything. But he was singing songs that come from the West Indies. You know? I wondered, because I, I wondered why Bob named Dennis Brown in the 70s um, Crown Prince. I just brought that up on my yes. the other day. Yes. I kept wondering, why did he say Crown Prince rather than King? Who was the King before that? Because Bob wasn't the King at the time, right? No, but, but the King thing didn't come to Bob yet. It was okay. Johnny Nash. It was Johnny Nash. He was called the King of Reggae. King of the, oh, right. Okay. Because he was touring and playing reggae music before Bob and the Whalers came into to, to the I States. See. Yeah. Right. So, so what happened now? Pitch Bartley introduced me to Bob and said, I'm well experienced and know about the road and everything and blah, blah, blah. You know, and then he said, Okay. He said to me, What month you born? And I said, August. And he said, What date? And I said, First. He said, you're a born leader. You know? <laughs> and that was, the, that was my initiation to join, join the group. You know, yes. so I traveled, yeah. traveling with them on the tour. So after we finished Max Kansas City, we were now touring with um, Sly and the Family Stone, yeah. which was a big um, group in, oh, in those yeah. days. Oh, you yeah. know, oh, big, yeah. big, big group. They had top oh, 10 yeah. hits and so on. Yeah, you remember that song that said, um, I want to thank you. Form, let me mm -hmm. be myself. Yes, yes. Again. Bum, bum, bum. Yes, yes, bum, yes. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yeah. They were a big, big group, right? Yes. Um, in 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 the seventies. So we were opening for them. So this myth that I see people publish all the while on Facebook about um Bob was burning up the trains, you know, and and Sly the family <laughs> sound couldn't take it. That's why they left us stranded. No, no, no. No, no, nothing like that. They thought we were more of an amateur group. We shouldn't be, they should, we shouldn't be on their bill. Oh, you see, okay. that's why they, they figured. Because our music, they were ready for, as a matter of fact, they were saying, they were calling our music back to front music. They said they never hear music play from the back to the front. <laughs> when, they, when they hear the, the reggae, you know, and they were a, 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 a punk, not a punk, a funk, a funk, funk group. Yes. You know, so um, when we got to Las Vegas, they got up early in the morning and take the bus and drive while they were stranded. 
Whoa. Yeah, they left us. They they left us stranded in um in Las Vegas. You know, so nowhere to go, no bus, nothing. You know. Oh my God. Yeah. So it it, it was an experience that you know. <laughs> every time I think about it, you know, what I mean, and people talk about it, you know, and um, I trying to share it with a lot of people, you know, um, you know, because it was something that actually frightened everybody because Bob called his mom in Delaware at the time to tell her about it. And then she started telling us to just jump on a ground bus and come down there. But Bob didn't want to go home. He wanted to stay out there and, you know, and fight a good fight because the Catch a Fire album was catching on. Plus they had another album waiting in the wing named Burning. Yes. And right. Burning album was released on the 19th of October, 1973 on Peter's birthday. Oh. So we're out there on the road promoting two albums now, Catch a Fire and Burning. And get stranded in Las Vegas by Sly and the Family Stone. And then the news spread across into California, where um, some Jamaicans who were going to college in California heard about it. And they drove, because you know, you know, you can drive from Las Vegas to um to California easily. Come on, come on, easily, right? Funny. And they came out there, right, and rescued us. And they um they spoke to a guy who had a club named the Metrics, right? Um, I will show you. This is a club named the Matrix. See it here? Oh, the Matrix, okay. Yeah, and this is the notice that the guy put up on the door, right? <laughs> that he kicked out the group that was there before oh. and put us in and yeah. gave us two nights because our, our Jamaican friend Gus Brown was telling him that this, these are the guys who wrote I Shot the Sheriff. Yeah. I Shot the Sheriff was a big song in America. Song. Yes, yes. You know? Yes. And these are the guys who wrote the song and created the song. So what the guy did is kick out the groups them that was there and give us two nights. Whoa, whoa, that's nice. And okay. then when he heard us playing, he just pulled out the entire paper here. You will see it in my book, you know. Yes. And give us four more nights. <laughs> <laughs> four more well, nights. Where, which, you know? where was that? Where, where was La, this was in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas still. Okay. okay. Yeah. No, no, no. The, 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 we got stranded in Las Vegas. No, they, they right? were talking about this was, this was in, the Matrix. This, was, this Matrix Club was in San Francisco. San Francisco. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 412 Broadway in San Francisco. Yes, right, yes. See, right there. My God, oh my God. So the guy put up the guy put up this sign. I kept it from 1973, you know. Put wow. up this sign on the door to say that the group that was there will not be performing and it will be the wayless performance. <laughs> <laughs> oh so so that, this was an experience that and then um Capital Radio who handles um, all of Island Records distribution mm. in the States, came out you now to rescue us now and took care of us and um, carried to their studio at the Capitol building in Los Angeles, did some recording. And then the group had to head back over to England now to, to promote the Burning Album. So the Burning Album was I out now. The release, okay, okay, okay. Right. So the, the group had to, head, they had to head back over to England. Now, Joe Higgs, who, who had fitted in for, for, for Bunny on the US tour now, not coming to England. Oh. So when the group went back to England now, it was just Bob and Peter and the musicians. Oh my gosh. It was just Bob and Peter, five people now, you know. Bob, Peter, and family man, his brother, and wire on the keyboards, you know. And then what happened now, it was in winter time, you know, and Peter Peter got sick. I right? think he caught new morning, right? And um, he took six so a great part of the tour had to be canceled. And when he got well, it was just about the last week of the tour. So after that tour was finished, Peter decided to quit the group. So Peter quit the group in in Bon Bonny quit in seventy three. Peter quit in seventy four, and Wire quit too in seventy four and went and joined a group named Taj Mahal. Oh. So Bob was just left now with just Family Man and Carly, the two Barrett brothers, bass and drum. Everybody had gone. Jeez, um, that's right? rough. And left him, you know, and he had the desire to push on. Yes. So he sat with, with, with Chris Blackwell and said, I am I'm pushing along, you know, I'm not gonna fall. 
So Chris said to him, well, just get some musician and put around your drum and bass people and augment it and continue the journey. Oh my so God. So what he did now, he went out and got um, um, uh, Alan, Issa, you know, um, Tyrone Downey, you know, and the eye trees yes. and put an aggregation of people together, seek a partisan and precautions. And then they went out now and start touring under the banner of Bob Marley and the Whalers. Right? <laughs> okay. But just to correct some things that people keep saying, a lot of people keep saying that it's Chris Blackwell mash up the group and call it Bob Marley and the Whalers. Mm -hmm. Well, that is that is totally incorrect. I heard right? that too. I heard that. Yeah, too. they were using the name Bob Marley and the Whalers from the day they left Coxon in 1967 which was six, six, seven years before they met Chris Blackwell. Okay. So when they had their own label, their own label, the title of their own label was Whale and Soul M, right? And, and the next, and another label they had named Top Gun, right? Okay. They had on it Bob Marley and the Whalers, okay. right? Okay. So they were using the name long before they met Chris Blackwell. So Chris Blackwell had nothing to do with the chair. As a matter of fact, when they signed their contract with Island Records, they signed under the auspices of Bob Marley and the Whalers. See a copy of the contract here. You can see Bob Marley, <laughs> oh, Bob Marley and the Whalers right up the top there. See there? You come up, 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 yes. <laughs> right, see there, Bob Marley and the Whalers right there. You see? Oh so their God. contract with Island was signed under Bob Marley and the Whalers. <sighs> right, that's what they signed under. You see, Excellent. Excellent. so, so th this myth that people put up all over social media about you know Chris Blackwell mash up the group and put Bob up front and say Bob Marley way that is totally incorrect. Okay, I'm glad you, you I'm glad you cleared that. Up. I have the proof to prove that they yes. what they should have done. They have a company named Top Gun Records, which right. was a registered company in Jamaica. Right. Here's a copy of their registration here, Top Gun oh, Records. God. Oh God. Right? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes. So what they should have done now is done their contracts through their record company. Right. So it would be Tough Gun Records for the services of the whalers. Mm -hmm. That means to say if anybody leave the group or should pass away, the shares are already arranged how everything is going to be distributed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you won't have no animosity and problem because forming a company, you have to put in all these things, you know. That if the, if the company is this, this what they call the word, this illusion, yeah. right? Shares are done the right and proper way and thing. But they were inexperienced then, you know, they didn't have the experience and they didn't have really an experienced manager then, mm -hmm. you know, it's after that now, when everybody left Bob to swim the rough waters by himself and he decided to, to stay focused and get other people around him and continue the journey, and then now uh, he started touring. And the first tour he did now was in the title, The Natty Dread Tour, because that was a new album, right? After Burning and Catch a Fire, then the next album was Natty Dread album. Oh, 76, right? yeah? 76. Yeah. yeah, and that, uh, it was 70, 75, 74, 75. 75. Yeah, okay. Right? And they started touring now. Bob Marley and the Whalers, yeah. the I-Trees was there to, yeah. to provide the harmonies and thing and so on. And, and then they start to move along, you know, and just <laughs> keep going and going and going. Because Bob was one of those people, you know, he had vision, you know, yes. right? He never had tunnel vision, you know. He always said the sky is the limit, yes. you know. And sometimes when he's doing interviews and people ask him, where do you think reggae is going to go? He said, listen, man, this music is going to go on and on and on until you find it right good place, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, Serious so, words, those are great words. Yeah, so he, you know, he... He, he, he was really a vision person, you know? Um, he looks far away down the line. He, even when he remember that show at Madison Square Garden, where yes. he opened for the Commodores. Yes. Suppose I tell you something that a lot of people don't even know until this very day. Bob Marley was never even booked on that show. The show was the Commodores and Curtis Blow. God, the Commodores were big at the time. Yes. Big, Absolutely. big. Lionel Absolutely. Richie had a lot of hit singles. Yes. With Diana Ross and all this, endlessly and all these things was racking up the charts. And the group itself was at, you know, Brick House and all these things. Oh, yes, but yeah. what happened now, um, Danny, Danny Sims, who used to work with Bob in the 60s, came back to work with Bob. And he's a man 
that has connections to, to pro, um, promoters and PR people. So what he did now, he, that show at Madison Square Garden was promoted by Frankie Crocker from WBLS. So Danny Sims cut a deal with um, Frankie Crocker to give Bob airplay on the song, Could You Be Loved, mm -hmm. right? And Bob would perform on the show. No, Bob, Bob didn't get no, no, no big money. Commodores get to nearly 100,000 at the time. Bob, Bob get 15,000, but he get to the band. It's a stipend, yeah. right? Because money wasn't the criteria in his head. Oh, he, wants to, he wants to cross over to a bigger audience, yes. right? So by opening for the Commodores, he would have that opportunity, right? And in lieu of that, he would get a lot of airplay on WBLS, which was the big black station in New York at the time. So that was the deal and the arrangement that oh, he got on that show. Because if you go back and listen to the ads, when the ads finished, they said also added to the show is Bob <laughs> and the Whalers, like a back and house kind of thing. You know? <laughs> yes, yes, but yes. it paid off for him. But I tell you something, you know, leading up to the show, everybody was telling Bob, don't do the show. It's going to hurt your career. But the Commodores are a big group, you know, and that the fans are coming there to see the Commodores. Of course, yeah. I remember sitting in, in the Essex House Hotel with Bob a um, couple of weeks before, because he came into New York to promote the song, you know, the, the single, Could You Be yes. Loved, you be know. Loved. And even the eyes of the brothers was calling him and telling him, don't do the show. Bob, don't do it. It's going to hurt your career. His, his publicist, Charlie Comer, came over. Bob, Bob, cancel out. Don't do it. Don't do it. And Bob sat down and I hear him say something that never leave me until this very day still with me. He said, the more they tell me, don't do it, the more strength I get. Do it. Because I want to prove everybody wrong. Yes. Right? Yes. And at that time, his contract with Ireland was up in and expired. So a lot of big companies were coming after him. Yes. Sony, you name them, CBS, everybody was coming after him. As a matter of fact, I sat there and heard a big whiz from a record company, called him. And when I heard what they were offering in the region of 10 million in those days, in, this was 1918, <laughs> right? And he said something that I was wondering this man a vision beyond compare because he getting all these big offer. And he turned to me and said, Kopi, you know, say, you see all the big company call me and thing and so. All the man doing it is sign me you know, and shelf me because I'm a threat to the big groups, them. Right, absolutely. And most of these companies, you know, the commodore were signed to them and Rick, Rick James and all these people. And he said something that I never forget. He said, you see me now, I prefer to be a big fish in a small pond. Because I get all the attention. Uh, <laughs> Instead of being a big fish in a big pond, water, where yes. I'm lost. Yes, you know? yes, yes, yes. And that to show you how the man was thinking, you know, a lot. Yes. And he stayed with Highland and renewed his contract with Highland and stayed with Chris Blackwell. Because yeah, he said when he's there, he gets all the attention. If he go to Sony and a big company, he's lost among so much a big fish. Yes. You know, yes, yes, and yes. that show at Madison Square Garden, I tell you, man. It was the most dramatic show I've ever seen. Because when he was ready to hit the stage, you know, one of his keyboard keyboard player could not be found was Wire. Oh. Right? Wire went out the street and then he gave his laminate to some girl. He and figured back. he can just come back into Madison Square Garden and say, I'm a member of the group. So when we were when Bob was ready to hit the stage, there was no wire. And Bob oh, said, We are going. And Bob decided to go without him. Jeez, um, right. Jeez. Right. He said, this is the most ecstatic moment in his career. He's not going to make one person stop him. That's right. right, yes. And then he didn't even get to do a sound check, right? Because the Commodores took up the entire evening because they were using a stage that the Bee Gees used, that big white stage where the yes. keyboard come out the ground and spin yes. around wow. and, wow. and, and thing. So Bob couldn't get a sound check. So what he did... He told the engineer that he's gonna use the first song as a sound check to balance the sound. And the first song was Natural Mystic. <laughs> Slow enough. Right? That's good. Natural <laughs> Mystic. You know, and and I tell you, you know, at that show, almost every group that was in the tri-state era came to see that show. There was Earth, Wind, and Fire backstage. 
Jay Work backstage, Curtis oh. Blow, and you name it, all the rappers them. So everybody have sent to see Bob Marley yes. going in front of the Commodores, <laughs> you know. But Bob was Bob was firm, you know, because Bob played the year before, 1979, at the Apollo Theater. And he did six days at the Apollo Theater because he wanted to win some more black folks, right? Because the black American wasn't into the reggae, you know, so he wanted to win over some more black folks and things. So he played six days at the Apollo, but that still wasn't enough for him. Yes, yes. So, and the year before that, in 1978, when he came back after the shooting thing and the, after the peace concert and he came back out, he played and headlined Madison Square Garden with a guy named Stanley Clark opening for him. Oh. So, so he could have he could have headlined the garden again and get yeah. big money, but yeah. he wasn't looking at the financial part. He's looking at yeah. crossing into a yeah. new audience. Yes. So if he's playing with the Commodores, he's gonna win some audience. And Absolutely. I can tell you, he won not the summer. He won the entire audience over. Because right? exactly. after that show line, and Richard went solo, he left the group <laughs> because <laughs> that night when Bob finished on that stage. It's the first time in my life. You see, you see people have light end of the year, and this is start 1918, Madison Square Garden. Oh. 20,000 people stand up with lighters in the air, screaming and shouting, Bob Marley, yeah. Bob Marley. Even when the Commodores came out and was singing, and even that line and which it song that he did with Diana Ross, she wasn't there, but he marked Dian Warwick to see that part. And Dian Warwick came out and joined him, and people still shouting, Bob Marley, Bob Marley, same way. He's, um, you know, and when the show was finished, man, I said, everybody come back to and I was just hugging Bob. Oh, God. I said, boy, Bob, well done, well done, well done. And then I heard Percy Sutton, who was the CEO of WBLS at the time, him and Danny seemed speaking backstage, and I heard where they said, well, Danny, he's ready for the big times. And they were planning <laughs> now to put Bob on tour with Stevie Wonder. Oh! That was the big thing that was in store. Jesus. But two days, two days after that, it collapsed in the park. As, as, as I was about to ask you, as you, you have to tell me about his experience. Yeah, experience. yeah because he played the 19th and the 20th at Madison Square Garden, right? And the next day, the 21st was off day. So he and Skill Cole and the rest of them went jogging in Central Park because it was just close by to, to Essex House Hotel that where he was staying, you know, and jogging in the park and then he collapsed. You know, um, Frat was coming the side of his mouth, Skip Cole was telling me. And then um, they took him to Sloan Kettering. Right? When they took him to Sloan Kettering up, uh, Hospital in Manhattan, which is on the east side. And they examined him and take x ray. When the doctors look at the x ray, the doctor looked at everybody standing there and said, Listen, this man only had three weeks less to live. Because the thing has saturated his body. Now, we're going to church back and I'm going to show you something, right? It actually started in 1977, when he was playing soccer in Europe and somebody stepped on his foot and his toe, right? And then um, it, it was giving him hell, you know, and pain. So when the first leg of the tour finished in Europe, he had the album Exodus out. So they were touring to promote Exodus. He went to the hospital in Miami, right? And the doctor diagnosed it that he had the, the skin cancer, this cancer. You know what the doctor name? The doctor's name was Dr. Bacon. William Bacon. Can you imagine? Here is a paper from the hospital. I keep it here from 1977. Yes, William Bacon, right? yes, MDP. Yes. And this is the assessment of what it is. Tell they me. had to take off. Can you read it? Is it okay to read? Yeah, I can read it to you. Please. It said September 2nd, 1977, Robert Marley, to whom it may concern, coming from Dr. Baker. Yes. He said the above mentioned patient was admitted to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital on August 23rd, 1977. Right? He underwent surgery on August 26, 1977. Surgery performed, and he put the names now, wide M block, XCH or excision, 
Mm -hmm. Right, I just read it now. Wide M block excision epoch e p o n y c h i u m. Mm -hmm. These are medical medical terms, right? And he said nail metric and dorsal cortex distal p h a l a n x of the right toe. Right, right toe. He said, split thickness of skin was grabbed from his left thigh. Oh. Some skin from his left thigh to put cool? under the toe, to patch the toe, right? To, you know, to, to the right, great toe. So it's a big toe, it's a great toe, right? And then he's, this was what the doctor said now. He will need to stay in the area for an undetermined period of time, which simply means he must have to keep attending to the doctor. That is where I heard things went wrong. Oh. Because he was surrounded, I understand, then by a lot of a lot of folks who were telling him all kind of things. I hear they said Rasta calf cancer and all this kind of thing. Right? No, this was 1977. Three years later, right? Three years later now, it spread to the body. And this was in 1980, it spread to the body, Sorry. right? And this is a certificate to show the thing. So when anybody running up them plate at the doctor and his name is Dr. B, you can't see there. Yes. And the diagnosis and the doctor tell her what he did that he, he had to grab a piece of his thigh to put yes. under the toe. Oh. Mm -hmm. And he must stay in the area, right? And, um, and, and attend the doctor regularly. That did not happen. Okay. Oh so in 1980, when he collapsed and they took him to Sloan Kettering, that's when they said his body was completely saturated. Right? And I and the doctor, I saw the x-ray in a car. I, were, I was working with Danny Sims after that. And I was able to see the x-rays. Right? And the doctor tell Danny Sims, say, don't stop the tour, you know. Just go on until him drop dead. Because oh. he only have three weeks to live. Jesus Christ. Oh and then God. Danny said, no, 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 no. We could never do that. Continue mm -hmm. working until him dropped dead. So they decided that after Pittsburgh, that was going to be the last show. Because Pittsburgh was just the fourth show of the tour. They had like two months to go. Oh. You know? So Pittsburgh was the last show. Because when he went down to Pittsburgh, you know, because Bob is always early, you know. So everybody in Pittsburgh already was suspecting something was wrong. Because Bob would, Bob would be the first one down in Pittsburgh with the next show. So when he didn't come, to, come down there, not, there yet, not yet, everybody started to wonder what was happening, what was happening, and then type of thing. Okay. You know, Rita was kind of suspect. I wasn't down there, you know, but Marcel and Rita told me about, you know, the whole thing happening down there, you know. And then when he went down, right, the guy who was his personal assistant named Desmond, he told Desmond to unskill called stand by the stage. And watch me, you know, cause boy, that if you see me, I go down. Oh, you know, you can't okay. hear from me, you know. And they said he did a sound check with one song, that song named "Lord, You Gotta Keep On Moving." He was just singing that song over and over for one one whole hour at sound check, you know. And then, if that was the last show, then they called a meeting and told everybody that the tour is cancelled. You know, and that's it, you know, and then um, he stayed in New York. He was staying over by um, Danny Sims' house. And that's when I got more closer to him to find out a lot of stuff. Cause everybody was sent home and he was staying at Danny Sims' house. And each night he would go out on the town. I remember one night, um, Pepe Sutton, who is the son of Percy Sutton and Ken Williams, came and picked him up and they went to see a play on Broadway named Your, your Arms Too Short to Box with God. <laughs> you know? And Bob wanted to go and see that play. <laughs> Bob went to Madison Square Garden and watched boxing. And he was just going on Broadway and look, looking at plays. He was just like somebody just enjoying himself. And then when he get late, now he come down to Ken Williams Club named, he named Negril, which was in Lower Manhattan. And we stayed the whole night till the wee man hang out with us. And I see Bob dance one night for three and a half hours non-stop. Right? He was coming there and Ken Williams invited all the Miss Jamaica, New York models, you know, and the beauty pageants them to come down the night and he had food stuck all over the place. And Bob was dancing 
as if take up one model and dance, and she tired him just take up another one. <laughs> man dance, <laughs> man dance, spooge, reggae, ska, punk, calypso, every single thing. He was just going non-stop. And then I remember now, when him take a break now, and him go inside the office sitting down, me, him, and Ken was here talking, and he was rolling a split. And I said to him, we call him Ska. That was, you know, our pet name. Right. And I said to him, say, Ska, like what the doctor tell you, say, you have three weeks to live. Oh, 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 you think about it, you know? I'm a rolling split. It's not even a split, you know, I call it a cone, you know, I'm a huge one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know something? Me not even thinking about that. Me just enjoy life and live my life to the fullest, you know? And it was just like that. You know what I mean? And just partying and just enjoying himself. And then now, as it started to narrow down, it started to get weak, you know, the ear that dropped off the one, you know, and they went, they met this doctor in New York. He came, Dr. Issel is a specialist from Germany. And he was in New York attending a seminar at the Pier Hotel, right? And is now, is the doctor now that, Bob, personal doctor, which was Pee Wee Fraser, was giving me this part of it now. He said that they went over to the Pier Hotel to see Dr. Issel, but you have to get passes to him going to the hotel because it was surgeons from around the world, top surgeon. So what they did, the waiter that is serving the food, they gave the waiter a hundred US dollar bill. <laughs> and write a note and tell him to carry it straight to Dr. Issel's table and give it to him. Because Bob was very well known in Germany. Right, right. Big in right. Germany already. So the waiter took the, the, the note to Dr. Issel. And when Dr. Issel saw it and he said, Bob Marley, and he said, yes, where is he? He's outside. You know, and he came out and spoke with them and said, okay, um, after the seminar, you know, they can come back. And they said they went back in the evening, met with him and talked with him and so on. And he said, well, you can take care of him, but he has to come to Germany. Oh. His clinic, because he has, a, he has a huge clinic in Germany. But this guy was a specialist when it comes to that kind of, of sickness. Guy. If he read his background, Dr. Issel, from the guest staff for days and things. So at that point now, they were preparing now to go to Germany. You know, um, Bob had lost weight. You know, I, I was told he came out about 90 pounds. The ear was off, no one thing and land. And him, Skill Cole, and Pee Wee Fraser, his personal doctor, right, flew off to, to Germany, you know, and stayed in, he stayed in Germany and was getting treatment. I remember at Danny Sims' house, Danny Sims got a call and said, boy, the doctor said that, it's the first time they see him get up in the bed and playing him guitar. And he was singing a song. We job people can make it work. Come together <laughs> and make it work. He was singing that song. And then he said, boy, you know, that's a good sign. You know, and he was over there, over there. And as you know, things get worse and worse. And then when the doctor saw that there's nothing else could have been done. Because let's, let's, you know, he was slated to live for three weeks after the 21st yeah. of September, 1980. And he lived until May the 11th, 1981. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Right? Where he, where he died on the way. He left the, um, Germany and was heading to Jamaica. Where he was given the order of merit and so on. But there was no direct flight to Jamaica, so they had to go via Miami. So when they flew into Miami, they took him over to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital to get treatment. And that's when he um, yeah, no, passed so. away. I remember, you know, Ziggy and them said to me when I was working with them, so when they were at the hospital bed, that their father looked at them and said, um, Ziggy's right name is David, you know, David. <laughs> yeah, David Marley. And he said, okay. David, <laughs> said, David Ziggy gave me this and said, he said, David, one thing I know, Money can't buy life, you know. Money can't buy life, you know. And that was imparting words to them, you know. What I mean, so money has never been his focus in life. I don't know if you watch some interviews that he, has, he did over the years, and he was doing an interview with his top journalist in New York, and he said, "Are you a rich man?" And then Baba asked him, 
rich? And the man said, yeah. Do you have a lot of money? And Bob said, money make you rich? And he said, yeah. He said, well, I don't want that kind of riches. Oh. My riches is health. No, and life God. everlasting. I don't want that. If money is your riches, it's not my riches. My life is not for me. My life is for people. If my life is for me alone, I don't want it. You know, when somebody can have that kind of, you know, attitude, you know, you must know how serious he was in his start. And, you know, and his songs, them, I can tell you, all the songs them that he wrote were songs of meaning, songs of experience. That song that he wrote, and he said, Holy Ground was my bed last night, and Rockstone was my pillow, talking blues. That was from an experience when he used to sleep around in the studio at Coxon, right? At night time. And he said, Holy Ground was my bed last night, and the Rockstone was his pillow, you know? Because during them time, you know, he, was, his, he and his mother was living with Bonnie Wheeler's father. Because remember, Bonnie Wheeler's father and, and, um, and Bob's mother, Miss Booker, were in a relationship and they had a daughter oh, who to call Bob, Bob brother and Bonnie brother. Yes. <laughs> you know I mean? So there was a family okay. thing there. So Bonnie and Bob actually lived together like brothers at oh, Mr. Livingston's home with, with Miss Booker. Okay. Right? Down okay. Oxford Street. These were the time when I was I was I was going to Chatula Park School at the time, yeah. you know. Because Master Griffiths, myself, and Bunny, and the original techniques with Slim Smith all went to school together. From we were five years of age, okay. so we know each other from way back, long before singing came into the picture, you know. So what happened is that Bob used to come in late at night from the studio, and Mr. Livingston was a disciplinarian, you know, and can't come into the house these late at night. See we are. So Bob used to sleep around at the studio, right? So that song came from that experience. Holy oh, ground was my bed last night. Rockstone my pillow too, right? Ambush in the night was from that shooting incident in December, nineteen seventy six. You know, um, and he wrote so many songs that were part of his experience and prediction for the future. A lot of them are come to pass in this time now. You know, and manifest in this time. You know, so you could say like you could say he was like Nanta Prophet God. He could see far ahead. You know, and hear him hear him say, "Them I got tired of seeing my face and can't get me out of the race." The man did forty years ago. He was the most popular artist in the world. The world. <laughs> That's what I mean. You know, I, I I recall saying to you that. Your journey is different from the regular artists, and, and yeah, exactly. You know, you know, because I experienced the experiences, right? And I think I was lucky, privileged, and honored to be present at some of the most historic moments in reggae music. And I think I was blessed with that. Might be God, you know, ordained me to be that. So when I can talk, I attack from experience. I'm not talking from something I see on social media. Right, or right. something me hear, or when me reading a book, right. you see. That's why my book is so different from everybody else's right. book. So you're you're mm -hmm. coming from ska and rock steady and early reggae, right? Yes. We, we, oh. I wonder if we can go back to to mentor. Yeah, right? mentor. Yeah, we can go yeah. all the way back mentor to mentor. Was, was the first yeah. one, and then we used to have this boogie woogie movie. Ta na 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 ta na 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 ta na 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 na. Remember oh, that yes. kind of sound? Yeah, yes. we used to yes. listen a lot to. WINZ in okay. Miami and the okay. New Orleans station. That's where we Jamaicans got our inspiration from. The New Orleans. And we used to listen yes. to those music a lot. Right. You know, right. so those artists from the parts that we know here and all them things influences us. Yes. You know, so so I started from the mentor, right, into the scar, mm -hmm. and then into Rocksteady, which was the greatest era. Next to the boy, we're so short, the best, we're so short the best right? Yes, the best, the best songs came yes. out during the, the rock steady era yes. where harmonies yes. was the greatest thing. Lead yeah, singing man. and harmonies come yeah, up, man. and the best songs best in, in Jamaica's world. history <laughs> came <laughs> through the shot. And that was the short of the period, you know. Yeah, that rock steady didn't last for more than about two years, yeah, yeah, from about 66 to 69. Yes, because yeah. reggae now started reggae coming, starts you know. Me. And so on. But that period was the best period where the best music. You have like the Middle Woodians, the gay lads, 
you, you know, know, the soulets, the, the gayless, you know, all these groups were singing yes. and yes. idolizing the American groups. I remember the wheelers, they used to dress in them slick suits, <laughs> with them hands stretch and so on, you know, because their their favorite group was the Impressions, Curtis Smithfield and the Impressions. Curtis Smithfield, oh, is that right? Okay. Right. You know? And that's, that's why that's I love even recorded that song, One Love It. It's a song that was written by Curtis Smithfield, you know, and he had some words to it, you know. Oh. That, that song here, One Love. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And you know something? It's just the other day, me and Skill Cole, you know, Skill Cole was a you personal know, friend of like, Bob. Okay. And Skill Cole said to me that it's him make Bob record the song, you know. He said, Bob didn't want to record One Love. He said, I'm not going to sing it because he's not going to get the royalties. He's going to go to Curtis Mayfield and Danny Sims because they had a publishing agreement with oh. Danny Sims. <laughs> and, and skill cool tell me same take up a baseball like that name and I say you have to go sing that tune now, you know. <laughs> really, you have to come at the studio. And he said, him just push Baba and say, come. And one love become the biggest song in Jamaica as it should be said there or yeah. there or by Arabella yeah. Respect, man. Respect, respect. Absolutely. Hey, everybody, yeah, yeah, everywhere you go, everybody singing one love. One love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. You know? And it's <laughs> What do you think of of the music now? I mean, I know that it's a, you 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 really regard the the rocksteady era. What, what do you think of the music now? Because it has well, you know something. Hmm. Um, with everything as a time, right? Because you have to move from one to the other. But I'm very concerned now because every time I travel around the world and people see me, they ask me, "Where's the love in the music that Bob left with you all?" Yes. You know, like the music now, I'm not love anymore. Yes. You know, it's about woman, you know, yes. gun, yes. you name it. You know, they, they, they said the music don't have the love and togetherness and the message that people can learn from, like back in the 70s and the early 80s. It yes. changed and it gone now to so cutting edge kind of music now. Disposable music that will last yes. a week or two. Yes. Look at Bob. Every one of Bob's songs recorded 40 years ago. It's well, still relevant now. If any one of them, people are still in them same way now, which shows that, you know, a good song will never good die. Quality. You see, yeah. a good song will never die. And I always encourage all the artists them now who are, who are recording to record good songs that can last with substance, sub good songs that can team kids can learn and be a part of them to help them groom. If you look at the songs then that was coming out in the 60s and 70s, they were trying to educate, you know, and uplift the mind and the soul. You know, the, the, the song them that coming out now, I don't even know where they're going. Some of them can't pass for trial, even if them disguised as an angel. <laughs> right? You see? And with all them, if them get past for trial, them just go sit down inside of the diaspora overseas, the Jamaican yes, and the West Indian diaspora overseas, yes, and don't move. Yeah. So when the white groups, them know, we have the our authentic reggae group, and this is the part that's very important. We dropped the good music. We created the good music. We created rap. A rap is a spinner from our DJing. You write Count Machuki and all them people there, and King Stitch originated it, and rap was a spinner from them from that, right? Now we created all of that. And now we drop that and start the, some bubblegum music, some watered down music that don't last a week or two, right? So the, the American groups them and the white groups them now, just do the authentic reggae where we let like, go. Oh. And it's, it, them are used now and I'll sell out place and I win Grammy with. So when everybody are run up them out and a chat bullshit, them to look back and say, we created that void because we let it go and turn we back on it. And start to follow, I start, we start to follow the rappers in them now. Yeah. Right? We yeah. created that, you know. And so we set our own a, yeah. We yeah. follow them now. Yeah. We follow them in a dressing. Yes. Drop your pants under your bottom yeah. and all this kind of thing. Right? Reggae music is a music that is going to last for you can till eternity. When you have a music where people want to dress like you, everybody want to read something red, gold, and green. People want to look like you, walk like you, talk like you. One time, locks was looked down on 
No, everybody knows it. So lax now is the biggest thing. Anybody, everybody know it's more a fashion and a style no more. So that's something contained to those Rastafari right now. You know, all sector of people you now wearing lax. One time you, know, you look on the, the American sports, and you look on uh, the football NFL, and you see a man oh. have a long lax. One time you would never see that. You would never you see know, that. It would you know, be accepted. You know, this ball, you never see a, a catcher, a, a batter. Yeah. You know, with, with long locks down because it wasn't, you know, but now look at it now. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying when you're tired, you see my face and can't get me out of the race. Right. And you can't get him out of the race, but man, this man, me travel some country, man. Right? And when them here say a Jamaica, we come from them, them never as a Jamaica, them say Bob Marley country. Yes, yes. I remember when I went to Thailand, right? First time I go to that region, you know, and he's a friend of mine lived there, he used to run a, 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 a reggae club. Named Reggae, Reggae Pub, no, Reggae Cafe in Fort Lauderdale. And he moved to Thailand and I bother me every day for come to Thailand. I said, Look how far Thailand then. Me <laughs> can just pick up God or so. And I look at the map, as he said, it was about five hours from Japan. So I wait, I tell him I will come there when I'm going to Japan to do a show. And lo and behold, I was going to Japan carrying a package there, you know, Live Wire Band, Master Griffith, Sanchez, Stone Love, you know, and um, to two, two of them DJs, right? And when the tour done, me just decided to go down to Thailand. And I flew down to Bangkok, right? And they meet me in a Bangkok and I carry me, flew me over now to an island named Koh Samoy, right? And when I land in Koh Samoy, and I drive going from the airport, and you come through the city, I see a big red, gold, and green banner with me name on the cross in, a, in the city center. And me say, what? I'm stopping and look on it and my friends say, wait until you see what we have for you. And they will carry me at the hotel. So I must take a shower, quick bed and freshen up and pick me up the limo, carry me and they carry me to a big welcome party. I mean, about a hundred Thai girls them with the thing around, the flowers around the waist, I dance around the place and thing. And I was sitting in the company of two Russian billionaires, yes. right, who owns whole heap of property in Thailand. Yes. You know, and when at that time now, um, it was the games in Beijing at the time, and 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 Bolt was breaking records over in Beijing. Yes, yes. You know? So when them hear now say a man from Bolt country is in Thailand, <laughs> what? Well, it was hell, man. They moved me out of the hotel, and the man give me him resort <laughs> to stay, a resort named Nissan's Resort. Oh my God! I went to spend a week. I ended up spending two and a half week. Jesus. Because the experience there, everybody on the island was treating me royally. You know, I have that whole thing in my book, even with pictures from there too, you know, and so on. And then we we um we went on a, on, a, on the, the billionaire Russian guy had a yacht, right? And we went on the yacht and we went to Cambodia, we went on the outskirts of China, and we went down the, 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 the what's the name of the river in in in, in um when Vietnam War. Forget where that river name, the yeah, name, that was, that was. Me Mekon, Mekon River. Yes, yes. You know, and we sail on that and sail on the whole island, I go up to Phuket, you know, and then we went on an island where they had full moon party. Can you imagine 90 <laughs> disco playing on this island and there were 20,000 people at this party? Jeez, um, Every single music that in the world was playing there. If you don't want to hear reggae, you go down to another place to hear rock, you go down to yes, and you move around 20,000 people and 90 disco discos. Yeah. So that was a great experience. To, you know, you have, you going have, that's, there that's and bringing nice. reggae there and thing and so on. You know, so that's that's great. Nice. So tell me, Bob Marley for, for hero, national hero. Uh, I, I want to tell you, it's going to happen. Some bureaucratic thing that I wouldn't want to say here. I know, you know, um, if he wasn't a ganja smoking guru, as some people call it, he probably get it a long time. Yes. But everything will manifest itself, you know, because they can't hide from that. Look at Barbados. Barbados give it to um to Rihanna yes. because she, she brings tourists to, to them country, yes. right? Who in the world is the most popular artist in the world? Bob Marley. Marley yes. And we have him, him is from Dilka Island from Jamaica. When, him, when Bob in 1980, when Bob drew 120,000 people in San Sara Stadium in Italy, the Pope is the biggest draw in the world 
And when them hear a little man come from a little island, draw 120,000 people, them get the globe and carry card. The Pope wants to see where the country is. I know he must spin it, he can't find it. He must use binoculars to find the little dot called Jamaica. <laughs> you see? So, uh, so, <laughs> no, so, 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 so the Boscobel Airport that they name in, in um, whatever the, that name is, should be Bob Marley name, right? What's that? The Muscobel Airport, that airport, that international airport that they just started over on the north coast there. You know that 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 um Muscobel? Muscobel, yes. That should yeah, be well, no, well that that is privately to own people, you know. That no, name no. of me, yes. Yeah. Remember, you know, say Goldfinger, what <laughs> was written there. And okay. um, what's the name of it? Um, Chris Blackwell and them are close. You okay. Know? So, so the, that that's airport in Muscobel was really private owned people then, you know. know. Um, James Van movie, the score was written there, and um, Goldfinger and the way named Flam, um, Flaming, I can't remember the right name. Yeah, you know? all right, all it's, right, it's, yeah. yeah, it's it's circulated around. Is that. there anybody like you now out there? Anybody like you who's developing into this type of work that you have, and and have you have you extended yourself into um, you know training other people to do the things that you did? Yeah, well, you know, um, I moved out from the era of being artist management. I've done that for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I, I moved over now and I, I have been doing um, PowerPoint presentations and lectures, you know, and seminars. I've done it in Australia too, right, about the music, you know, and Jamaica's culture and things like that. That's the era I was going to concentrate on now. I don't need to manage no more artists than now. Because what happened, you see, you see, even the Japanese, them, they know more about the history of our music than even some of our own Jamaicans here, you know? And a lot of people don't know much about the history, even the generation now, right? I understand what two years ago that some people up, students up in UW, I don't even know who is Dennis Brown, don't even know who is culture, don't even know who is Justin Hines. But if you ask a Japanese man who is into reggae, he can tell you everything when them band, when the music is everything. Because when we go to Japan, splash, you know, right? We have 60, 70, 80,000 people. Them that speak English, but them singing every reggae song in English. Uh, you see, them singing the song in English, yes. you know? And that was one of the marvelous things for us, you know? Yes, yes. We could have just really learned it, you know, the, the near word, Goma, Doma de Gato. You know, <laughs> and, and get, can, can, let's get let's do it. Yes, you know, yes, and things yes, like that. Yes. Hello, no matter gato. You know, and them things and so on. We learn the count the song. Them know all of the words I mean, of the song and singing along with you. You know, so the music is a powerful music. The the the, the Bible said, "All things shall perish from under the sky. Music alone shall it never shall die." And the reggae music gonna be the music that is gonna live on and on. You know, because as Bob said, it's going to just keep going on and on until you find it rightful place. And it's rightful place is the universe. Because there was a time when anybody wanted to hear music or record, they them have to come to Jamaica. Now in every country of a reggae band now, you know, all China, right? If you go in a Brazil, where Germany have 2,500 sound system. In Germany alone, 2,500 sound system. And every country have a reggae band and a, a, a reggae fever going in them country just to show you how we can do. So when you have a music that everybody wants to sing like you, walk like you, talk like you, dress like you, right? Eat food like you, that means that you're special, you know? And that's what the music is on Jamaica. We have, a, we have really something in our hand, you know? A yeah. gold mine. Show us a book again and tell us how to get it, please. And if you yes, are, well, the, the name of the book is, is Reggae My Life Is, right? You can see it here. It's red, right? It's um, written by yours truly here. And with an um, assistant from Clyde McKenzie, who was the editor, and Maxine McDonough, right? It's published by Down Sound Book Publishing and Ray Bird's Publishers in the United States. You can get it on Amazon.com. You just put in Amazon.com and put in the title of the book, Reggae My Life Is, and everything pops up in your face, right? You get it next day, next day delivery, right at your doorstep. 
As a matter of fact, all my friends in Australia, they ordered it and within two, three days, they said it was on their doorstep, you know, because everybody wants to get a whole light. So it's not just a book about just me. It's an encyclopedia about the history of our music, about the some of the artists there. It, it, I highlight some of the, 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 the stuff about artists, some of the mistakes they make, so the young ones don't come and make the same mistakes, you know, and a lot of things about the artists. Them. I didn't go into personal thing about their personal yeah. life, yeah, you yes. know, because most artists are worried about that because they say I know a lot of things about them life. It's not about that. But you have to talk about some of the things them and the mistakes that some of them made so that those young ones coming up don't go and make the same mistake like them. So I have to talk about a few things then. And some people may not like some of the things them, but I did not create the scene. You did. So if you made some bad mistake and wrong thing, I'd have to talk about it. But then people will learn and know not to go down that same road. So it's not just a book to just read and have fun. You know, it teaches you, right? You learn a lot, you know, and the history of our music and about some of the artists them when they start and the kind of song they sing and the touring with them, what it was like. Look at it, even when Jimmy Cliff, when I took Jimmy Cliff to South Africa, 1980, the whole of it is in this book. So you are the one who took him to South Africa? Yes, I am the one in 1980. And we did three big massive show down there, one in Soweto and one in, um, in, in Durban and one in Cape Town. Wow. You know, and that was a historic moment in life. That, and it's all told in the book that I'll never forget. Because during them time, they, you know, um, Nelson Mandela was still in prison, you know. And we went, when we were in Cape Town, we went up to Table Mountain and took all the drums up there, man, and beat drums all day. You could look down on Robbins Island where, where Nelson Mandela was, you know. So it was a great, great experience, you know, that I spoke about in the book, you know. And it's, it's very important. You know, that everybody really, you can get it on eBay too, and, and Barnes and Nobles, you know. So it's a very important book. And I, I just implore all my friends and well-wishers, just get this book and I guarantee you're not going to put it down. You won't want to read it constantly because everybody will get them book and go on social media and post it up. I know a guy took off a day from work so he can read the book. He don't want to read and stop. He <laughs> want to read it through. And he said, read it from the front all the way to the back. Because on the back, I've had some people who, who write some good words about me, you know, like, you yes. know, Richard Branson, yes. Chris Blackwell, you know, and uh, some people from big people in the world, you know. So, and the pictures are there. It has some very nice historic pictures, you yes. know, Don King, myself, you know, Bernie Spear, you know, um, myself with, with, with um, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, Sly and Ravi, the eye trees, yes. you know. And it has some very, very historic pictures. Dennis Brown, you know, Marcel Griffiths doing the electric slide at the White House <laughs> when, when, when Obama yes, was, I was that. coming in power and thing, you know. That's wow, you wow. Know, with, with the people at I one of the bars. Oh, my know. God. Oh so my God. It's a very historic book, so everybody should get it. Reggae, you know. Reggae, My Life is by Copeland Ford, yeah. the giant of a man. I thank you so much, my God. This has been such, uh, you know, this has been so fulfilling for me. And I'm sure I've seen a lot of co um, comments coming in. People are saying things like um, uh, um, undiluted news, good description, um, uh, bubblegum music. <laughs> That's really <laughs> nice. Thank you so much for, for, for joining me, man. And, and, and I, I'm telling you, this has been so enlightening, especially that Dennis Brown and Bob Marley piece. We have a long way to go. Oh, my God. Thank yeah, you. man. And, and I must thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk. But I, I can talk for six hours. <laughs> I, already, you know. I went to Cuba. I went to Jimmy Cliff to Cuba. And I was a speaker at one of the, the conference there. And I went, when I got four hours, nobody wanted to move. Jesus, you know? oh <laughs> my God. Start, you know? oh, but I'm glad it. that I, I I got the opportunity to you to yes. speak up and, and, you know, about not just my book right. alone, you know, but it's the like, history of the music, to yes. talk about some of the artists them that I've worked with, yes. you know, and um, give a, 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 a little historic story about some of the memorable events yes. and places and things that happened in the journey, because I'm yes. celebrating my 60th anniversary 
in the music fraternity, you know, and I have to give God thanks for that, you know, for keeping me all through the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the highs and the lows that I can sit here to talk about it and to enlighten the people and with some of the true facts and stories, because this book don't have everything, you know, right. it's too much. Somebody published it last week and said, um, if the book was to put everything, I'll be walking around with a Ulysses. <laughs> 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 so I'm going to have a part two and a part three, oh, you know, because there's a lot of stuff that wasn't yes. in it, you know, yes. yeah, but man. I wanted to make this first one to cover as much of the spectrum of the music as, as possible. So yes. people can learn from, you know, it educate, it illuminate, it eradicate, and it will always be there to educate everybody and people can learn from it. So I want to thank you and your people, your company, and thank the people out in music and reggae land, yes. those who have supported us over the years and come to our concert here and there and look out for the reggae. My life is poor, oh. the book tour. Yes. Which is going to be something similar, like you know, last year we went and did the book release with okay. Sly and the, and the revolutionaries okay. in, in Spain yes. in front of 25,000 people and viewed by millions around the world. Yes. So, we're going to go on the road with a Reggae My Life is tour, and we're going to have some of the artists who are in the book. Okay, we'll Before keep in it. touch. We'll keep in touch. Yeah, man, definitely. So, thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, man, and I respect. thank everyone who supported your show and keep on listening because it's education and it's good for the soul. Thanks. Right. Everyone. I'm going to stay out. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.